find your seats, please. All right. Jeff says that we're live. I want to say hi to all the folks who are tuning in virtually, and I hope that you can hear me speak <laughs> or read my lips. <laughs> um, we have been having some trouble with the audio on the live stream. We're trying to figure it out, um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that we have a virtual audience for the summit. The summit is always streamed live and for free. Uh, it's also recorded, and if you're interested in um, any of the summits for the past, you know, I don't even know how many years those recordings uh, exist there and I invite you to check them out if you're interested in any of the speakers or topics that we have addressed over the years. Um, it is my um, distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Karen Swan. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a memory thing um, in the spirit of the 20th anniversary here, but uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with Karen or her work or history. She was a professor in the Department of Education Theory and Practice at the University at Albany uh, for some years. For I, I'm not sure how many, but 15. for 15 years, apparently. And back in 19... 96, Seven. 97. She was one. Thank you. <laughs> she was one of the first uh, professors that I, as uh, the first online instructional designer in SUNY, had the privilege to work with. Uh, uh, Larry Greenberg and I uh, worked with her uh, and a, um, a couple of other faculty in that year uh, quite closely. And so, um, for me, she is formative. Uh, in terms of her research and her interests in online teaching and learning and many of the things that we do today in online teaching and learning can be traced directly back to uh, Dr. Karen Swan. I am so thrilled that you are able to be here to celebrate with us this um, great um, anniversary and that you are here to share with us um, your um, current thoughts on social presence in online uh, teaching. And um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself the rest of the way. But thank you so very much for being here, Karen. Am I good? Can you hear me? OK, good. I'm so happy to be here. You just cannot even imagine. It's like coming home. I, I, I'm in uh, Chicago now, and uh, it's flat. <laughs> I'm going to talk about social presence, which you may probably all have heard a thousand times. But um, it, it seems like it's timely, and I'm delighted to talk about it because it's easy for me to talk about. So I'm going to talk about three things. What social presence is, which maybe seems silly, but I, I don't think it is. What difference does it make? And probably most importantly, how can we support its development in online classes? So what is social presence? Well, the reason why this is kind of important is that social presence is used uh, throughout the research and, and educational uh, offerings on it. It's used to mean a lot of different things. And I think it's kind of important, not necessarily to decide on one definition, because it's not going to happen, but to make, make people aware of what it is that you're talking about when you talk about social presence. This uh, quote from Patrick Lowenthal is really a good one, I think. He says, the theory of social presence is perhaps the most popular construct used to describe and understand how people socially interact in online learning environments. However, despite its intuitive appeal, researchers and practitioners alike often define and conceptualize this popular construct differently. In fact, it's often hard to distinguish between whether someone is talking about social interaction, immediacy, intimacy, emotion, and or connectedness when they talk about social presence. So this, this disconnect between what social presence means and what people are talking about led me and some other colleagues to create a book of um, an, an edited book of research on social presence that we actually split depending on 
the perspective people had on, on social presence. So we distinguish three distinct uh, perspectives, and there's more, I think. But the three that we picked were the technological, thinking of social presence as a function of the technology, thinking of social presence as a learner perspective, and thinking of social presence as a literacy. And I'll go through all of those three. So the first thing you have to think about is where this notion of social presence comes from. And the place it comes from in face-to-face -face research is research on what's called teacher immediacy, usually. And what this has to do with is the psychological distance between people who are communicating. And the important thing to notice here is there's verbal and nonverbal uh, behaviors that are counted as immediacy. And this is going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, this is, this is going to come over into what we're, what we're talking about, social presence online, because obviously the nonverbals we, we can't or we couldn't do in, in the beginning. This is one of, like, one of Eric's slides. The, there's a lot of information here, but the, the big takeaway is that there's been a ton of research on immediacy in face-to-face -face classrooms, and what it ends up saying is there's a link between teacher immediacy and learning, and so it's important. So building on this notion of immediacy, early communications researchers who were looking at text-based, you know, bulletin board kind of interaction among people online, uh, looked at it in terms of the ability of the medium to project the salience of others. And they assumed this was difficult because you can't wave your hands in text and you can't change your voice and you can't see my face and, uh, and know that I'm smiling when I tell a joke. So, um, so this original work suggested that computer-mediated communication was probably the worst medium to transmit the presence of others. And there's, there's three kinds of theories. Um, social presence theory is the first, but other people have tried to bring it back, Rice in particular and Picard, who tried to add to it, and, but these are all medium theories of social presence. And you'll, you'll see in the end that there's some more coming back because as we improve our technologies, then technology starts to figure into the notion of social presence, again, considering the fact that you can have video or live interactions. But this original, this original notion of social presence boils down to this. On the inter internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And that's the general idea. You can't tell who somebody is as well. Their, their, their presence isn't transmitted on the internet. So really early on in the 90s, people started thinking about this and decided that the folks who were saying that you couldn't project social presence were the people who were people who had never tried using computer mediated communication. So in fact, <clears throat> Joe Walther called it hyperpersonal. And I, I think you've you've anybody who's worked online knows that people a lot of people will disclose a lot more of themselves than they would in a face to face communication. So Lonnie Gunawardina in particular took over this notion of social presence and instead of meaning the quality of the medium, had it to be how people perceive other people through the medium. And this is the, I have, I have one of those things that's showing me what's about to come up and I'm trying to figure out which is coming up, <coughs> sorry. Um, this is the notion of social presence that has been taken over by the community of inquiry framework. In fact, Terry Anderson was one of Lonnie's students. So, and they started with this idea of social presence when they started thinking about it. In the community of inquiry framework, social presence means the ability of participants in a virtual community of inquiry 
to project themselves socially and emotionally and to perceive each other as real people. That's the Randy Garrison definition. Um, and you'll find this differently all over the place, but the three components of it are affective communication, group cohesion, and open communication. Now, when I started to work on this book, it's because um, Michael Moore sent me uh, the, the proposal for the book and asked me to comment on it. And I said that the, the people who were proposing it had no idea what social presence was because they were talking about it as a literacy, which is what led to this book. But I, I've come to understand what they meant by that, which is that you can teach students and teachers to um, understand what social presence is and therefore project and perceive more social presence than they would otherwise. So in the, I call them the Amy's, Amy Whitehead and Amy Garrett Dickers. In their opinion, social presence is a kind of literacy. And Amy Whitehead has a really interesting uh, article, I think it was in Educause, it's either there or in Inside Higher Ed, I can't remember which one it is, where she talks about social presence being embodied by Mr. Rogers. And I think that's a wonderful way of thinking about it. I was, I was just watching that. Um, have you seen that, the movie about Mr. Rogers? It's wonderful. But it, he's like, he has so much social presence. It's like the, the perfect uh, epitome of what social presence is. So another way of thinking about what something is, is thinking about how we can measure it. And the research on social presence has sort of two strands. One is content analysis, where you look at online discussion and sometimes beyond on online discussion to look for particular indicators of social presence. Th these are mine, but there are other ones. And I was just looking at one that the, the terrible thing about all of these things is if you, if you change the indicators, you change the outcomes. So it's important to know what they are, but this is affective indicators. Uh, I, I'm sure you probably know what these are. Um, cohesive indicators. These are these are interesting. We, as we, as we started coding, we found some that just turned up that we weren't expecting. And one is this notion of course reflection, reflecting back on something that happened at the beginning of a course, and that helps you to think about yourself as a group. And finally, the interactive indicators, which are probably the, I'm, I'm going to give this, um, these slides will be available so you don't have to write this down. Interactive indicators are probably the most important because these are the glue that holds uh, a discussion together and moves the discussion forward to actually start creating knowledge. Um, acknowledgement, agreement, and disagreement, approval, invitation, and personal advice that you actually see people starting to give each other in discussion boards, which I think is incredibly interesting. The other way to measure, and I, I should go back. Well, anyway, the, the content analysis is looking at how people project social presence the kinds of things that are survey instruments are looking at how people perceive social presence. So you're actually looking at two sides of the same coin. Um, but I think that, you know, I'm one of those people who really doesn't like survey data because I'm never sure about how valid it is. But I think in this case it's very valid. Because if you think of, especially if you think of social presence as the perceptions of the learners. So the only people who can tell you what they're perceiving is the learners themselves. So I think that it's really quite valuable. These are, um, these are, these are survey items that were taken um, from the, some research that Jennifer Richardson and I did which are, and, and they're um, 
they're taken from the original ones that Lonnie Gunawardena did. But in this particular uh, study, we looked at the difference between the social presence of peers and the social presence of instructors, and that which is now being called instructor presence, I think. But they turn out to be different. And they turn out to um, result in different things. The social presence of peers has a lot to do with how satisfied students are about the, the course that they're in. The social presence of instructors has a lot to do with how much students think they learn. And they're, they're two different things. And I think you need both. but. Um, but they are different and they have different effects and you can think about them that way. It, it's also important to realize that the social presence of instructors matters a lot. These are um, the social presence items from the COI survey. I don't know if people know about that, but they're the part of the community of inquiry survey that measures social presence. And this is nice because then you can relate social presence, teaching presence, and cognitive presence to each other within the same survey. So what difference does it make? Is, is social presence really that important? In an era where we have competency-based and uh, adaptive learning that sometimes doesn't have an instructor anywhere near it, d do these things make a difference? Well, of course, I think so, because it, it's my career. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we do know that students can project their, their personalities into an online environment. Oh, I don't have one. I, somewhere here I have one of yours, Tony. I, I, I don't know where it is. That students make up for the lack of visual and auditory cues by using just text. Uh, and maybe text with some funny spellings and emoticons. And finally, that, um, that studies that look at how people perceive it, and this is, this is Lonnie Gunawardena, the, the quote, participants create social presence by projecting their identities and building online communities. And here's a, this is, this is some content analysis research that we did. And what it's looking at is um, the three different kinds. The red is uh, affective indicators, the yellow is interactive indicators, and the light blue is, um, is cohesive indicators. And the, the, the blue at the beginning, that's the number of responses that we took these from. And, and so you'll see that there's almost six indicators per post in students' um, postings. But the other thing to look at is almost, well, the cohesive indicators start to go down right, right almost right away. Because, and I think this is because it's important to build a sense of a group at the beginning of a course, and that it becomes less important once it's established. The affective indicators, which are the, um, the emotion, belief, those kind of ones, are the most, the most common, but they sort of follow the, the course of the course. The number of responses goes like this across the course. Anyway, but the really important one is the interactive indicators grow. And that means people are getting better at interacting with each other to create knowledge. So there's that. So. Probably the most important piece of research we have that shows how important social presence is, is this work that Wally Boston did that looked at, oh gosh, I can try to remember, like over 40,000 students and found that social presence predicts over 21% of the variance in retention, semester to semester retention that students will come back if they think that there's a community there that they're a part of. And I think that's incredibly important. It's also incredibly important because when you start um, it, with the COI 
survey looking at things relative to one another, social presence is probably the least important of, of the ones that come out that way. Um, social presence predicts satisfaction. There it is. Social presence predicts perceived learning, and social presence in some studies have predicted actual learning, and you can ask Tony about that. He did a, a really wonderful study that, that looked at social presence and found a difference. That the kind of learning that has to do with learning facts, it, it doesn't have much to do with, but the kind of learning that has to do with understanding multiple perspectives and being able to take other opinions into account it does affect, and that's what's kind of really neat about it. Uh, this one's Peter's, <laughs> and this shows social presence as a mediating variable between teaching presence and cognitive presence, so it's important that way, too. And finally, what I, I, I want to talk about is that what I think is the most important part, which is how can we support the development of social presence and I want to talk about it in terms of research findings and then what you can do in classes to, um, to support its development. We know that verbal immediacy behaviors, that's the social presence indicators, can lessen the psychological dif distance between communicators, and this means between learners and professors and learners and learners and that it's linked to satisfaction, learning, and retention in courses. So what can you do to, um, to help its development? One thing you can do is, is have initial course activities that, uh, that, that are low value, but help people trust each other. And it's important that it's done immediately, because trust is like something that happens right at the beginning of a course. You can model as a teacher and encourage the use of verbal immediacy behaviors yourself. You can encourage students to share their experiences, which is really probably the best part of a, a discussion. And you can explicitly introduce the notion of social presence and verbal immediacy. And that's the social presence as a literacy approach, and it, it really can be very useful. We know that we have research that tells us that student learning is related to the quantity and quality of postings in online discussion and to the value that instructors place on that. And that's a, a really important part. Value means grades. If you don't grade discussion, you're not going to get as much discussion as you will if you make people participate. But you can often make people participate and they end up liking it and doing much more than you're requiring. So make participation in discussion graded. Develop rubrics for it. I, I've done some research where I, by changing the ru rubrics, I could change the kinds of discussion I was getting. So for example, for one, I, want, I asked people to extend other people's postings. And in that one, it, what it did is resulted in people reading more of other people's postings than in uh, any other condition I had. And another one, I asked them to um, link what they were talking about to what they were studying in the text, and not that I have text, but in the text of my lectures. And, um, and what I found there was longer postings. So there's a lot of things you can do to improve or to make discussion what you want it to be. Um, Learning occurs socially within communities of practice, and um, there, we found a greater variability, this is from Alfred Rove, in community ratings in online settings than in face-to-face -face settings. And I think that is sort of something that tells us that you have to work at it online, whereas you don't have to work at it in a classroom. So, Things to do are to design community building activities, model the use of cohesive behaviors, develop, again, develop initial activities, develop group activities and tasks. I know students hate them, but they, they I, I've had a lot of students at the end say, oh, that was a good idea. Um, and make discussion an important part of their grade. 
uh, the work of two has a lot of uh, stuff that, and, and some work I did too, shows that course design is significantly related to the development of social presence. This is the, um, if you build it, they will come, and if you don't build it, they can't come. Uh, so you should design for the development of social presence by um, including multiple and varied discussion forums and group activities. And I think another one is, and I'm, I didn't put it in here, but I, I journal with my students, so I talk privately with my students. So if we're talking about instructor social presence, that's one place where I can, t an another place where I can talk to them without them um, being afraid to open their, open their mouth, to talk in the, in the discussion. Um, instructors develop social presence through their interactions with students in a variety of activities, so I'm probably going to say it here. The, it's really important that you provide timely feedback to students online. I'm sure you all know that. But, um, but they think you're a computer. And if you aren't responding right away, they, they can't figure out what's going on. Um, include social presence indicators in your feedback to students. So that means using their name, using, uh, saying that was a really great thing that you did, that, that sort of thing. And reference related activities in your uh, responses to students. The quality and quantity of instructor interactions with students is related to student learning. Social presence develops from teaching presence. So provide frequent opportunities for both public and private interactions with students and clear expectations for, for when you're going to be online and when you're going to talk to them. If you're one of those people who doesn't want to do any work on the weekend, that you should tell them that you're not going to do that. And provide timely and supportive feedback. I was thinking of something, I can't remember what it was. Um, instructor social presence and the social presence of peers are different but, and support different parts of the educational experience. So similarly, different students perceive and project different amounts of social presence. and it's very, very interesting. And so how to deal with this is to design different types of activities to get at developing social presence for different kinds of people. And I think it's really important to orient students to the notion of social presence. When we, when we looked at, I did some research where we looked at the people who perceived the most social presence and the people who perceived the least. And we uh, did interviews with them, and what we found was really interesting. That they, all, the people who, who, the high and the low, both said that they really appreciated the discussion. The high said they really appreciated the discussion because it gave them other people's viewpoints. The people who were low said they really appreciated the discussion because it gave them a chance to think about what they wanted to say and articulate their point of view. So there's these two really different approaches that you need to think about. Um, I don't think there's anything else there. Social presence in online discussions develops over time. That's the one that we, where I, you saw those bar charts. Cohesive indicators are important at the beginning. Affective indicators are always important. And interactive indicators become more important as the course progresses. So it's important for you to model their use and encourage students to use them themselves. To stress cohesive indicators, talk about the class as a group, use people's names, refer to things that have happened in the class. And, and so you do that at the beginning, but then if you require participants in the discussion to respond to other people, and if you require them to respond in particular ways, like if you want them to expand or disagree or something like that, you can increase the number of interactive indicators, you can increase the interaction, and that's really what you want in a discussion. 
there's some research that says there's greater learning from online discussion when discussions are scaffolded, and uh, which means that the that instructors are facilitating discussion in such a way that they're uh, rewarding particular kinds of behaviors. So you can do this with both content and process. Content is rewarding particular content that is expressed, and process has to do with making people respond to, to certain other people. Uh, Jennifer Richardson does some really interesting work with peer review of discussion posts because nobody wants to have to really grade all the discussion postings other than, um, I, I use rubrics, but I only use them if somebody isn't doing what I want. I don't really look at it. I, you have to read every discussion posting because you never know when it's going to go south. But you don't have to read them for grading, but you can. But an easier way to do it is to have your students grade each other. And what she did was use Bloom's taxonomy, just high and low, and have students uh, reward that. So on the one hand, people are realizing they're going to be graded by their peers. And on the other hand, they're thinking about what's a high and what's a, a low Bloom's uh, response. And so they're pitching the discussion higher than they would normally. Um, grading rubrics. Oh, subject lines. Bill Peltz. Somebody here has to know Bill Peltz. Got, yeah. <laughs> got really disgusted at the at the subject lines that were showing up in his students' postings because they were, you know, remarry. They were, they were just saying things that didn't have any information. So he started taking off his grades for discussions by bad subject lines. And it's amazing how quickly he got subject lines that were informative. Discussion threads die when participants don't respond to them immediately. There, there's some really interesting research by Jim Hewitt at Boise in Canada that shows that um, discussions grow like wildfire at the edges, that people don't come back to things that they've already um, that they've already looked at. So if you make students responsible for sustaining discussion threads, or you make them summarize discussion threads, or you require them to incorporate materials from the discussion into other assignments, then they will spend more time with the, the meat of it and less time just uh, sticking things at the edge. Some work by Leah Sutton about vicarious interaction that shows that um, she, she categorizes people into actors and vicarious actors and posters. You know, there's people who just go into the discussion, post what they have to say. The, the same people who like to articulate their take on the whatever the discussion is and then move on. And she found that the people who aren't posting but are in fact reading all the posts are actually interacting more than and learning more than the people who um, who are just posting all the time but not reading anything else. So you can encourage and support this if you uh, look at what people read. There's ways you can grade for what people read. You can require discussion summaries, which makes them read, or or you can use tracking mechanisms. And these are getting more and more available as, and less and less onerous to have to look at. So I wanted to, to look a little bit at the technology. Because remember we started with saying that uh, technology is, uh, <coughs> technology was originally one of the notions of that social presence was a factor was a function of technology. Well, with the, what I was saying before, with new technologies, some of these can influence social presence. And there's ways we can use them to support different pieces of social presence. So we know that audio feedback, for example, instead of written feedback in assignments, uh, enhances social presence and enhances learning. 
and I think it goes this way. So we can we can use it. And you can also do voice over commentary. I've seen people who who will if you have an essay, as you read it, you can see it scrolling, they will add voice over to the um to the the paper that they're reading. I think you have to be a nice person to do that. I I I'm not sure I could do it. I, I get really angry sometimes with students as I'm, as I'm reading what they're saying. And so I have to um, go back and change what I'm writing sometimes. Um, secondly, messaging to both individual and groups can enhance instructor social presence. So you can use, you can use announcements for social messaging, you can use email, and you can journal, and you can text if you have their phone numbers and it all helps. Pictures added to introductions, I, uh, probably most of you, if you work online, um, have something like a meet your classmates or an initial activity that students do so they get to know each other. Uh, adding pictures to that uh, helps, and it's a simple, it's a very simple thing. And But it, if people put post pictures of themselves, you can, you know who you're, you can think of a person when you're writing to them. This, this, is, this is a spontaneous thing that happened in one of my classes where everybody started sending pictures of their pets. <laughs> so you can encourage students to attach those photographs. Uh, Patrick Lowenthal has a photo roster for the, his class so he can share it with students so you can bring up the picture and think about that picture when you're writing to the people. And a, another idea in, like that is um, having students choose five pictures that they think represent themselves. And it doesn't have to be pictures of themselves. It just has to be pictures that represent themselves. I think I didn't write that right. Online video, both synchronous and asynchronous, which is sometimes easier to deal with in online classes, can add to perceived and projected social presence. So you can use video to introduce students to the course, to yourself, to the modules. I was just reading, I, I don't know where it came from, but I was just reading something that said students won't listen to any more than two minutes of video. And so you should make it short if you're going to do something like that. But you can use it for introductions. You can hold synchronous video office hours. Never worked for me, but a lot of people do it and it works. You can have video feedback, not just audio feedback, video feedback. Digital storytelling, I think, is one of the, the best ways to, um, to use video. I, I have it now in assignments in two courses where students can produce. You, you can even just use a simple PowerPoint with um, pictures. But it's, it's a really nice way to, uh, to create knowledge. And I think the more we can do in other media, the better. And uh, you can use asynchronous video in discussions. Social media, which we thought was going to be great, is not necessarily great. The, the research is mixed on social media. I think because people, uh, students want their social media to be their social media and not have their teachers in there or something like that. So I know people who have used Facebook as an LMS, and if you make a group, you can do it. And you can also use Twitter. I think people, there's a lot of people who use Twitter well to support just-in-time uh, social interactions with their students. And these become like the interactions that you have after class or before class when you get to talk to students about other things. So. To summarize the technology part of it, and these come from Patrick Lowenthal, media alone does not establish social presence. People do. And it's important to always remember that. The way you use communication technologies matters, and your context should always influence your use. Use things that work well for what it is you want to do. Teachers and students need practice using new communication devices so that they're comfortable using them. 
and students and faculty both do better with emerging technologies when you um, tell them why they're using them and what it's going to afford them. And if you, whenever you can, give students and teachers, if you're the technology people, uh, options so that they can use multiple kinds of technology so they aren't just incredibly frustrated. So to summarize the, this whole thing, knowledge is socially constructed and learning is a social process. It's therefore important to deliberately support the development of social presence in online classes to support that process, whatever the format. And that's it. Oh, good. I Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that better? Yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I actually wanted to uh, highlight one of the questions that came across Twitter from Kristen Moeller. Uh, she stated, we heard mixed reviews from students yesterday about discussion boards. We know that social presence is important, though, so how can we help these students see the value and intrinsically want to participate? And also, I think we still have some of those students here today, don't we? So I might be curious to hear what they thought about this talk. Are there any of the students from the panel yesterday in the room? I know there are a couple here. Okay, um, Karen. D d d they want. Oh, he oh. stepped out. Yeah, he stepped out. Never mind. Yeah, I, I love discussion boards, and I know that there are students that hate discussion boards, and hate having to do it. I think if you give enough points, it's. You know, students are always looking for how they can get extra points. So if the discussion boards are well um, valued, and I also give extra points for discussion, so it's a way that you can get extra points by participating. And the more you try to highlight things that students have in common, and may, I, I, I like to make my discussion boards more um, not so content focused and more process focused and more based on students' experience. So I teach graduate students, so it's sometimes hard for me to, to understand what it's like to be undergraduate students. But I, I have taught them. And I think that by valuing their experience, by having questions, prompts in the discussion that ask them to bring their experience to it rather than bring something from the textbook to it because they can read the textbook. What you want is to have, be able to have students um, share experiences and relate it to the content. And th that's what learning is about anyway. So um, I actually responded uh, in Twitter to, to, Karen, to Kristen's uh, uh, initial question. And I, I think to um, add on to what Karen is saying, I think this highlights the importance for us as uh, instructional designers or faculty, the importance of, um, uh, of instructional design and effective online course design. I think some of the variability that we see in students in their responses to online discussions uh, ha may have uh, more to do with how that's actually being done and facilitated and supported in the online class. And so we as instructional designers and, and experts in that type of pedagogy are in excellent positions to um, guide and support faculty in the effective ways to construct online discussions so that they result um, in um, effective and engaging and um, uh, productive uh, um, learning experiences on the part of the students. So I think all of us in, in the room uh, kind of see that, I think, pretty I think clearly. it's also discipline specific. Yeah. And I thought of that while you were talking. I, I, I had colleagues at RPI who had a terrible time getting discussion going. Engineers do not want to talk to each other. They want to talk to the professor. 
So I think that in those kinds of situations, what they found they could do is instead of discussing something, put out problems for them to solve and have it like a contest, which tends to work. I tried it in my classes, which is educators, and it fell totally flat on its face. So I think you have to know who your audience is, who your students are, and what's going to um, entice them into doing something in the discussion. Hi, Karen. I'm Pam Youngs Maher at Upstate Medical University. Thank you for being here for the 20th anniversary. It's nice to have you back. Um, I'm one of the folks with Alex's, you know, team of um, folks that got mentored on the community of inquiry, and I found your research years ago to really help faculty understand the importance of social presence. I think many of them understood the importance of the cognitive and teaching presence, not as much the social presence, and so that research base was really helpful. As you went through your presentation, I was glad to see how recent technology is, is feeding into some of the research findings. Many of the examples that you were sharing with us in the slides spoke to what I would call the learning activities that engage the students, the discussions, some of the assignments, feedback on the assignments. I'm curious about research that has been done more recently where faculty are using a lot of the technology, particularly media, video, and so on, to ramp up the teaching presence part of their role because the feedback that I'm hearing anecdotally from students is that they are more likely to pay attention to lectures when they are no longer text-based but delivered audio-visually um, because they're used to that kind of um, delivery anymore and they're used to the five-minute lessons and what they got on Sesame Street and through YouTube and very quickly <laughs> and an hour or a two-hour lecture does not keep their attention so I'm just wondering I didn't see research about using social presence to ramp up teaching presence so I'm just curious about that there's there's quite a bit and I would um, uh, Patrick Lowenthal has done a real lot and in that book he has a whole chapter on what we know from technology it's, it's 2017 the world changes incredibly quickly but it's a very very good chapter and it goes through all of those kinds of things I think you're absolutely right about the the five minute video it, and I think that if you can if you can chunk your lectures into what are the most important points and make very small videos about those points. Those are really useful. The hour-long lecture is, is a total dud. The, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to have to read an hour-long lecture as print either. So I think that, and I and I really liked your comment about the Sesame Street generation because Sesame Street was made that way, and we are growing up when. Sesame Street came out, adults would read, were good for about 15 minutes of video. I think it's changed immensely over time. Hi, Karen. Greg Koch from SUNY Oswego. Um, I, first, a comment. You know, I was struck by your usage of CMC, computer mediated communication, and, and as we were talking out in the hall, doing a lit review and reading Lowenthal and feeling a little sad that Lowenthal had to define for readers what CMC meant made me feel kind of old. Uh, you know, an understanding that for those of us who've been doing this since before there was the web, we know what CMC meant in a text-based environment, but, but I digress. Um, I'm, I'm having a major episode of cognitive dissonance this morning in the sense that we in this room fundamentally understand that knowledge is socially constructed. We accept that premise. At the same time, the institution has challenged us to grow at scale <laughs> in ways that potentially de-emphasize the social aspect of learning. Uh, because as you've just reflected, you've just reflected a lot upon discussion strategies. I've looked in the literature to try to understand what we know about course sizing. And simply put, the literature is inconclusive. 
when we try to measure the impacts of course sizing on various things like learning outcomes and student satisfaction. It's all over the place. Uh, and I think it also depends upon the discipline and it depends upon the level. So, so none of it really helps us in guidance, is, is my conclusion. So here we are uh, saying, let's enroll 500 students. And I don't feel it aligns with our, our, our thoughts right now uh, on what is pedagogically sound. So, so save us, Karen, save us. Tell us what to do, OK? <laughs> I'm a dinosaur. I'm not going to, you know, I, I, I think we need to look ahead. But there's research being done on adaptive learning now. And I would suggest that. Because what they're finding is when it works, it works because there's a person guiding students maybe in a classroom or maybe online but there is interaction there that that is going on I, I, I had a colleague um, when I was at Kent State who built a wonderful course that had a, um, a, a kind of competency based beginning but as people came out of that competency it was on psychology and as they came out of having like the basic foundation of psychology then he would put them in groups to do a project. I think there are ways that you can scale, but still have some presence. And I think something like that is the perfect design, because then you don't just have teacher presence, you have student-to-student uh, -student interactions that, that are really important. I'm, I'm really afraid of what kind of a, a world we're creating, because some part of education is about socialization and people need to be able to interact with each other and if they're not learning how to do that we're, we're going to have a much more unpleasant world to live in where people just don't understand each other so can i can i say one thing um greg i i think we can't apply the same um, solution to all of the problems right <laughs> and so I think of my own self as a learner and I taught myself HTML myself I didn't go to school for that I taught myself how to knit myself with YouTube videos so so if but but if we say that every student under all conditions can be um, you know educated or trained um, in that manner, that just isn't true. We need different solutions for different problems, and I think the the issue today is is trying to solve all the problems with the same solution. So I think we need to think about that, right? Um, and think about our own experiences as learners, as instructional designers, as faculty, as people, and and try and make the best choices and decisions given, like for me, right, you know, the answer to life, the universe, and everything is instructional design, right? So if you have to teach 500 people, that's going to be different than if you're teaching a graduate class of nine people. And the same ways, it's not the same way, you don't teach them in the same way. So anyway, that's my two cents. I think Meg had a question. Who did? Oh, okay. Next, Brenda. Hi, Karen. Brandon Murphy from SUNY ESF. Um, so, as as we are looking to grow our online enrollment of of fully online students, we know that college is more than just a the sum experience of a series of courses and assignments. And so I'm wondering, is there research that informs the role of social presence at the programmatic level? So that, that these experiences, these interactions with faculty, these informal interactions, you know, all these things that happen on a college campus have potential, uh, a role in students' long-term success beyond college and also with their role as alumni of the college. So is there is there research that informs how we do this at a programmatic level for online students beyond just uh, the individual not course level? It's social presence research. It's research on something that's sometimes called fit. Whether or not students are academically and socially integrated into the life of the college. And it mostly has to do with retention and progression, the stuff that I've seen. But it, but it, it's well worth looking at. I don't know about the. Pro th that sounds like good research to do, doesn't it? 
And what could you do as a program? I'm Camille Carlson, Suffolk County Community College. It's a pleasure to hear you. Um, my question has to do with um, framing distance and online learning uh, not as a self-directed process or independent study, but that that social component really is uh, what makes it distinctive. Coupled with, um, on the federal level, we're getting a lot of attention on what uh, a faculty regular and substantive engagement looks like. So it takes on a bigger parameter. I guess I have more of a comment and a question. And where do you, where do you see this moving? And in these types of definitions that, that we hope to be emerging? I don't really know. But I, I share your comment. I, I, I do know that, that the work on, first place, I don't think adaptive learning is really personalized learning. I think that it, I think that's a misnomer to some extent because you're putting people through a set of things that you came up with the same as you would with a, a regular course. And even if it is self-directed, it's self-directed through something that somebody else has chosen. Um, but I do know that in most of those instances, there's an advisor or a teacher or somebody that's really important to those people. But Back to the previous comment, I think that there's a real lot, some of the best part of my undergraduate education was talking to other people, to other students, having that kind of, having that kind of an experience which sort of takes you out of your own discipline. I think that's what you're speaking to. So that you're learning stuff about the world that you know, I, I, and I don't know how to replace it at all. I, I really, I don't, and I don't have to worry about it because I'm old, and it's you that are going to have to worry about it. But I hopefully, s somebody will come up with some way to do that, and I don't think discussion boards is going to do it. You know. All right, on that cheery note. <laughs> Um, we're going to take a break um, for 15 minutes, and then we're coming back for our, um, which one is it, the ninth annual Unsession. Um, if you're unfamiliar, if this is your first time um, at the summit, we have an Unsession um, session at, uh, at every summit where everyone in the room is invited to come and share something about their work, uh, their research, their area of interest with the whole community and I have a Google Doc that is set up where you can um, sign up and we'll go in what in that order um, and I'll put the link for it um, it's in the program but I'll put it up on the screen in a sec and so be thinking about what you want to share with the community during that time and um, and then you know if nobody comes up I'm gonna call on you so just be prepared okay um, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Karen Swan for being here um, Thank you so much, Karen. Really appreciate it. She's going to be here for the rest of the, uh, at least today, I, I, tomorrow too. Um, so if you have uh, further questions for her, please seek her out. It's an amazing opportunity to have her here. Thank you very much.